Right, so today, um, this is another version of the, uh, for those of you who joined us already uh, on Tuesday, today as part of the Social Care Recovery and Resilience Project, looking at what lessons we can learn from other countries, we'll be looking at Denmark. And we'll start with a brief introdu the introduction to the project. We'll try and do that quickly because some of you have already seen that before. And then we'll go on to hear about the experience of Denmark uh, from Pasatina Roskat and Laura Schepler. So I'm going to start uh, sharing some slides on the introduction to today. And um, yeah, so uh, as I said, there, this is part of a project on learning lessons from international responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in long-term care systems. Uh, it's a project funded by NIHR and any uh, views that we will express, these are our own uh, of the authors and not of the NIHR, the Department of Health and Social Care, Toronto School of Economics, or the Nafield Trust. And here is a list of all the people who've contributed to the project. The aim of the project is to learn lessons um, from policy and practice from international COVID-19 experiences and also from scientific evidence to support the English social care sector to recover from COVID-19 in the short term, to be able to better withstand future waves of COVID-19 and similar shocks in the medium term and to become more resilient in the long term. Now, the methods we used uh, was to think very carefully about what it is that we needed to learn about. And for that, we did a situational analysis of the English social care COVID experience, and we also did a theory of change workshop and other forms of engagement with stakeholders and people involved, people with lived experience, to understand what were the key priority topics and areas where evidence and learning was needed. And then we, uh, in parallel, we then scoped what was, the, what was there to learn from, and we looked um, at the scientific evidence through a living mapping of scientific evidence, and then we looked at accounts of international experiences written by experts on long-term care that you can find in the LTC COVID uh, website. From that, we went on to choose four countries from where le relevant lessons can be learned for England. We're also in parallel conducting uh, additional evidence reviews. And we chose four countries. We chose Denmark, France, Japan, and the Netherlands. We heard about um, the Netherlands on Tuesday. We'll be sharing the video if for some of you, those of you who couldn't attend. And uh, next week, we'll be hearing of Japan and I think the week after or soon after from France. When we have uh, finished these case studies, we'll be doing a bit more engagement to co-develop policy and practice recommendations that are relevant to the social care sector in England. And through that, we'll be revisiting the theory of change. So just going on to thinking about uh, just a very quick uh, thought uh, on how can we compare how long-term care systems performed in the pandemic? Well, the, the quick answer is that this is a very difficult answer, uh, question to answer. There are no metrics for international comparisons of performance of long-term care systems from before the pandemic. So we, we never really had a good way of saying which systems perform better at providing care. <laughs> Uh, but we have some measures from the pandemic, such as the deaths attributed to COVID uh, or, or of people who use and provide care. We also could look at the extent to which uh, long-term care systems were able to continue to provide good quality care and support for people who don't care in supporting unpaid carers. And we could also look at the impacts on the well-being of people who draw on care and provide paid and unpaid care. But none of these the type of data is very easy to compare, even the deaths um, data. And to give you uh, an impression of how different also the experience of the COVID pandemic was in general, not just in the care home population or the long-term care population, but in the whole population, we have very big differences on how much the pandemic impacted the, the four countries that we're looking at for the case study and the UK, the UK has had um, by now um, just over 300 uh, deaths per 100,000 population, whereas in Japan, they're looking at 56. So there have been very big differences on how deep the impact has been 
And this has translated into the long-term care system in the sense that we find that there's a very clear correlation between the deaths that happened in the community and the deaths that happened in care homes. There's difficulty to compare the data, but we, we can see that there's this very strong relationship and it seems that how much COVID there was in the community was actually the biggest predictor of how many people would then die in care homes. And of course, all the other aspects of performance of the care system are very complex indeed. And now I'll pass on to Natasha, who's going to tell you a bit about what we found from looking at the experience of the English social care sector. Thanks, Adelina. Yeah, I'll just very briefly touch on our England res research because I know everyone's here to hear about Denmark. Um, but I just want to make clear that we've looked at the four case study countries through the lens of England and through the lens of understanding what happened in England in the COVID, in those early weeks of COVID and what that tells us about the structural weaknesses of the English social care system. So we went through a process of interviews and documentary analysis and workshops with stakeholders to identify what, what people think are the main priorities for reform. If we are to build a more resilient system and I won't run through all of our sort of findings but I wanted to give you a flavor of the priorities that we were sort of um, coming across so we've put these into three sort of categories the first one is around the system and how the system's designed so the English system is very complex with very confusing accountability structures and governance with a, a mix of national and local government private providers, a vast array of different provision. Um, and in the in COVID, that became a, an impediment to the to the response. And there was real confused confusion around who was responsible for which part of the system. And that became quite an, an, an issue. One of the other things that we found were the there were missed opportunities in the in the decade before COVID to really prepare the long term care the, or the social care system in the English context um, for a shock such as COVID. And we think that's really important going forward that we, we learn from that and, and prepare the system better for future shocks. There was a, a, a range of findings around what we've called people here and, and a sense that there was not a great understanding of the, the complexity and the diversity of the social care sector in the in the response and the guidance that was issued. And again, that sort of created delays and confusion in people trying to access um, support. At the, co at the time that COVID hit, the workforce was in quite a, a serious state with high levels of vacancies and high turnover. And, and I think at the point at which COVID hit, um, the workforce was not in a very robust um, state to cope with the, the pandemic. And I think in the response, there was a sort of a lack of proper understanding of some of the structural um, characteristics of the, the workforce. For example, about 25% of, of care workers are on a zero hours contract. So they didn't have um, reliable access to sick pay. That wasn't taken into account when the guidance around isolation was put in place, But um, for example. And so that had implications for how effective some of these strategies were containing um, infections. And then the last sort of bucket of, of um, findings was around resourcing. Um, so the decade before COVID was marked by austerity um, and cuts to funding for social care and that, that eroded the ability of the system to invest in facilities and I think that really came became a problem um, when care homes were, were required to isolate people who were coming out of hospital with um, positive COVID tests or possibly symptomatic and, the, and the, the infrastructure was not set up for coping with with that sort of um, situation and then the, the one last point around the stability of the funding so the emergency funding that was put in to support providers during COVID was very welcome, but it was very sporadic and not, not very certain. So it didn't really aid the forward planning um, in local areas. So that's the flavour of the kind of priorities that we've found. And we've used those to, to identify countries. Can you just go to the next slide, Adelina? Um, so we've done an international mapping, looking at countries where there might be relevant learning, where we can translate that back into the English context. Um, and so that was a, a, a high level exercise. And that's how we got to our four case study countries, which France, Netherlands, Denmark and Japan. And we're going to hear about Denmark now. So I'm going to hand over to Laura and Tina. Thank you, Natasha. Um, just wait for the slides to come up. Okay, thank you, Adelina. Um, okay, can you just skip to the, why did we choose Denmark slide, please? 
Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so why did we choose Denmark? Well, um, during our country scoping, it really stood out to us as an example of a system that stood up relatively way, uh, well to the pandemic um, with low overall infection rates and mortality and um, importantly, also quite limited impact on service provision. And as such, it's shown itself to have weathered the storm quite well. And we thought that this would allow us to learn about the features that help to make a social care system resilient and some of the themes that sparked our interest and really spoke to the situation in England um, and where we thought we, we might see some interesting learning um, are the strong local autonomy in the Danish system. And I'm going to explain about this in a bit. Um, there's a strong tradition of community-based care, um, a relatively well-trained, highly professionalized workforce. Um, and um, the system has also a um, high level of integration across social care and health and strong discharge processes. And it's the, the system is very much focused on prevention, reablement and independence. Um, so could you go to the next slide, please? Um, so first of all, to give you an overview of the Danish long-term care system, um, it's considered as one of the most universal and comprehensive systems of the world. Um, it's well-funded, affordable, and it offers equal access to high-quality services, and it comes at no cost for home, home care and means-tested co-payment in residential care. And as such, it enjoys quite strong public and also political support. Um, in terms of its governance, um, as I've just alluded to, it's, it's highly decentralized with um, a small number of quite large municipalities organizing, funding, and regulating care. And funding comes from national and local taxes. And interestingly, there's also distribution of money from richer to less wealthy municipalities to reduce regional disparities. And um, there's a strong focus on independent living. So care is mostly provided at home and in so-called modern nursing facilities, which are characterized by residents um, living in separate apartments with their own facilities. Um, and importantly, people also pay, they, they pay rent and they live in their own um, apartment, basically in a nursing home. Um, and at a local level, there's a high level of integration across health and sort of care providers, which makes multidisciplinary working um, sort of a standard characteristic of long-term care. And there's also strong partnership with the voluntary sector. But yeah, it's not all rosy in Denmark. Um, so in recent years, there's um, been seen a shift towards more um, informal care provision um, and reduced access to home care and also some shortage of nursing home care. Um, next slide, please. And next I'll come to the COVID impact and response. Um, so in terms of the impact, um, as I said, it's been, um, well, from, from our perspective here in England, um, relatively successful containment with overall low infection and mortality rates. Um, there was a slight excess mortality in care homes, um, although, again, compared to, to other countries, the share of nursing home mortality is still below what has been seen in other countries. Um, and overall service provision was not severely affected. Um, which is very much in contrast to the situation here in England, where many community and voluntary services close down. Um, I think in Denmark, the, um, some of the preventative home visits and reablement closed down for, for a short period, but overall normal service levels were retained. And in care homes, activities took place one-to-one um, -one or in small groups, which helped with well-being of residents. And um, the care market remained relatively stable. Um, similar to England, there's also workforce pressures, staff shortages have increased. I've read estimates of around 1 to 10 percent um, due to burnout and issues around pay and working conditions. Um, and there was general support of measures, but um, the strict visitation rules and care homes that were implemented at the beginning were later questions due to the impact this had on physical and mental health of residents. And um, Tina, we were just talking just before this call, you, you, you mentioned that there is debate also in Denmark on whether the response, well, the impact of COVID, whether it was good or bad. And um, I just wondered whether you have some reflections at this point um, that you'd like to share. Well, I think, first of all, for, for most people, it's uh, everything happened so fast and, and with no prior knowledge of anything. So uh, I think 
we, we tended to to look at ourselves and, and be quite self-critical, uh, also because we knew that the data across countries was not always comparable. Um, and that's also to do with the way you, you register uh, mortality, whether it's due to COVID or or you die with COVID, which we, that that was a big discussion in in, in Denmark. So so the realization that, um, as as also the slides that Adelina showed, that it's it's really to do with um, how widespread um, COVID was in in the community. Also, um, it 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 took a while, uh, I think, and and then we realized that that we were quite strict in terms of lockdowns and so on, and that had a positive effect in, in containing the uh, the virus um, but whether to say something is a, is a success or relative success I think that's very difficult because we we as you say we, we did see an uh, excess mortality um, but what we also saw was the negative um, consequences of the lockdowns um, and in terms of of loneliness and 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 mental in issues and this was of course not not only uh, in the population of older people needing care but but for the population in general so it's so it's I'm, I'm just pointing out that it's it's difficult to to say anything is a success story but it it seemed we we managed uh, relatively well I would say. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, um, maybe we'll move on to the response. Um, and yeah, the, the things that really stand out to us in England. Um, and first of all, it's important to highlight that similar to England, um, the Danish long term care sector was pretty unprepared and there were no routine, um, no routines in place in terms of infection control and, and managing a pandemic. Um, but there are certain features of the system that resulted in, in a relatively effective response and ensured um, certain level of resilience that we have not seen here in England. Um, so one of the observations um, in England was a lack of established um, relationships and collaboration that impeded the response. And in Denmark, we are quite struck that yeah, by, by, the, by the advanced integration of services um, in your system, and this seems to have aided the response in terms of utilizing those pre-existing relationships and structures and really working together towards a shared goal. And Tina, um, would you say that this is sort of a reasonable, reasonable um, judgment and what do you think helped at the time? Yeah, I think this is um, an, an accurate uh, observation. And it's and can I say it's been really interesting to be part of this study because it's only when we start comparing countries then we realize we did things differently. Um, but but it, so so part of of, of my uh, role in in your project has been to 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 conduct a, a desk uh, work um, a desk based uh, report, but also to conduct interviews. Um, and it it really became clear to me when I spoke to uh, managers of home care and also uh, of a nursing home um, that they pointed out that the existing uh, communication systems were very good uh, because there was already established a clear means of contact. And also um, one example is that the home care managers, they have local uh, um, team meetings, uh, not team meetings, but they have meetings where the, the local managers, they meet up quite regularly. So all of these uh, uh, communication channels were already established. And also, um, and, and we do have a quite uh, digital system. Um, Denmark is, 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 is relatively digitalized, I would say, in terms of other countries. So communication flows well, maybe also in, in, in that sense. So also from central to local level, um, it seemed that um, communication went uh, quite smoothly and, and especially in, in crisis situations like this where um, the managers pointed out, of course, that there was a lot of communication to and, and, and information to take in. Um, they were overburdened. Uh, and I think one of my realizations from doing uh, the interviews was that perhaps we have been focusing a lot on front uh, care staff and maybe, I don't know if, if that's only the case in Denmark, but it seemed to me that the the managers, they they are suffering really now from, they haven't had vacation mm. for a very long time and they're suffering really from post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, sort of. They, they uh, I should say what one manager was was really affected when when uh, when doing, doing the interviews. So it's just to say that, um, they really struggled, but they managed, and they also feel from the interviews that it it they did well. It was like a war zone, they said, but but uh, it 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 worked out in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that really struck me as well when I conducted interviews. Um, 
because I also yeah, spoke to, to people in the municipality and, and they said that it was really the sort of the most mutual support, the trust, the strong leadership, people coming together and really working towards that shared priority. Um, yeah, and that that um, that really sort of helped to, to, to move that forward. Um, and I, I guess another issue that we had here was sort of this lack of visibility so that the sector is not really, it's not really visible on, on a national level, like in terms of decision making and, and what was needed um, and who's responsible for what. And I understand that in Denmark, you've got that um, large degree of local autonomy um, also during the pandemic. But I, I think there was also a bit of this tension between the national level giving the guidelines in terms of infection control, but then the local level being very much used to making their own decisions. And I wonder how how did that play out, play out during during the pandemic? I, I think it actually played out well in the sense that, um, and 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 we, we're going to touch about, upon that with the integration of health and social care, but but um, because there is a lot of, of, of health focus, uh, we are used to the, um, the health authorities. Um, they have a very strong impact in terms of how, how work is organized in, in the sector. Um, so, so there are many regulations um, that, uh, the, that the sector has to take into account and, and so on. So it's not, uh, yes, there's autonomy in, in the sense of, of, of setting the, the level of provision and the quality standards and and, and so on, um, but but that you also have to comply to a number of regulations. Um, so I really think uh, and 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 you mentioned the the trust um, and that came that struck me really when I did the interviews also said that, that they really the managers really mentioned that they they really trusted that that the national authorities were doing a good job and and uh, and trying to to ease the situation uh, for, for them at the local level what what was a concern was the political part in in you can say the national authorities uh, needing to to come out as a, as a, with a strong uh, case of that they were in control and then sometimes um they they kind of uh, they introduced a new uh, rule or regulation, and and everybody at the at families and 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 so on staff assumed that this would be implemented immediately. So 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 the lack of understanding that it takes a while to to often to translate also from from national uh, rules and regulations into what can we do locally, and also to to implement it at a local level. Um, and it was like if it was introduced Saturday morning, then everybody assumed that it would be implemented uh, Monday morning. Um, uh, so, so there was a bit of tiredness uh, eventually, also because um, and and one uh, nursing home, uh, the nursing home manager, she said, "Well, then I started not opening my my not checking my my email Saturday mornings because I thought, okay, it can wait until Monday." So, so the system uh, survived in that sense uh, because it was strong enough, and there was this trust that yes, the central authorities, uh, national authorities, they they are doing the best that uh, they can. So, so we 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 do trust uh, and and. And I think everybody's and, and and that was the, the assumption in 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 the interviews that people were working together and collaborating the the best that they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, in terms of integration, I wonder. So you you've got the I, I think one one of the things I'm quite struck with, and this is quite a hot topic here in England at the moment, is in terms of discharge, and it was during the pandemic as well. Um, mass discharges of people from hospital into care homes, and in Denmark, you've got you've got very well established. To us, it looks like well, well functioning, multidisciplinary discharge teams. Um, you've got very low, uh, lower lengths of stay in hospitals, and you've got these established discharge um, flows into um, social care. And I wonder how, yeah, was that impacted by the pandemic, and or did it help during the response? Yeah, it 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 didn't seem uh, from the interviews that it wasn't. Uh, an issue, uh, as you say, we have we have established procedures. For instance, we have at the hospitals, um, the local community will have um, an assessment team uh, already there at the hospital, uh, interviewing the patient and, and asking them about what their needs are, and in that sense, uh, smoothing the the transition from hospital to to the community. Um, but it seemed, uh, and we did have uh, some some uh, patients going from hospital to to nursing homes to to stay there. But it was mainly residents, it seemed, and and not uh, we we had other places where people who were um, uh, had had the infection who could go and stay. They didn't need to to uh, st to to stay in in the nursing homes. So in comparison to other countries, it didn't seem to affect 
uh, and increase the risk of, of infection at, at the nursing homes in, in terms of discharging uh, patients uh, who had COVID to the nursing homes. Um, and, and the nursing homes also uh, were quite good at, at, uh, at isolating uh, um, um, residents who had uh, COVID and setting up a, a, a special sections uh, for these. Um, so in, in that sense, it, they managed as well, it seemed. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating from from our perspective. Um, maybe we'll. Is, is there anything, any other reflections you have on on this theme um, before we move on to on on discharge or uh, on on system level response? Um, um, maybe in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we'll move on to the next one then. Um, we can come back to it. Alina, could you? Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, um, people, it's one of the other priorities here in England as um, Natasha outlined earlier. And um, there are really sort of two things that really stood out. Um, one is around um, having, again, compared to, to the situation here in England, a well-trained professionalized workforce. Um, and sort of my, my question is around infection control. I think one of the issues we, we saw here is that staff, they often work, they work across multiple providers and um, that made training around infection control quite difficult. Um, and my understanding, especially also from the interviews you conducted, Tina, is that infection control is something that that staff were, were trained up quite quickly, quite well. Is, is that reasonable to, to say that? And what do you think helped? Yes, I think because there was uh, because they have a, a basic education in both health and social care. Uh, so the understanding in terms of hygiene, for instance, where where uh, they they it, it, from the interviews it seems it was uh, th there was a basic understanding and it was um, really um, very quickly staff understood the need for 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 better hygiene. Um, there were local uh, nurses, uh, hygiene nurses, who who came round to the nursing homes also and and did uh, on on site training. Um, but but the managers are pointing out that the the because they have this basic understand a uh, basic training in in in, in health, uh, then the, there was a quick understanding for for the need to step up procedures. Um, so I think that helps very well. We have right now we have seventy five percent of staff with um, with. Ed education in health and social care. Uh, it has been uh, decreasing also because of, as, as already mentioned, there's a shortage of staff and we're trying to introduce um, people uh, into the sector. Uh, so, so that is a concern, but generally uh, we, the people uh, in place, um, there will be colleagues around them with who have some, some uh, basic training in, in health and social care. Mm -hmm. thing. Um, the other thing that, that really stood out um, well, one, one of the issues we had here was that staff weren't that well supported. And for instance, they didn't have access often to, to sick pay, um, which had very far reaching um, sort of implications for their ability and their willingness to isolate. Um, how were staff supported in Denmark? And yeah, do you think that was an appropriate level of support? Well, I, th I think, uh, and maybe that goes back to your former slide, uh, initially staff in the, in the long-term care sector felt that they were not prioritized in terms of, of uh, uh, PPE, so they, there was a lack of PPE in, in the sector. Um, and, and that's because we prioritized uh, the health uh, sector, the hospitals. Um, so there was this uh, sort of... Um, it was a lack of recognition that that the work which was being done was was also very important and and uh, therefore staff should be protected so but that changed uh, when when the ppa situation uh, improved um and and then um i mean there there was there was a concern also in especially in the nursing homes because a, a number of the of the residents have have dementia and so on so there was always this um should should you um, the, the the manager of the nursing home, for instance, uh, emphasize that she um, many many of the staff members they they use uh, the I ne never know the, what is it called in English the the the, the visier uh, visor? Well, yeah visor <laughs> okay thank you um, so so wearing a mask in 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 front of a of a resident with with mm. dementia for instance doesn't work you can't see the the face or the the mouth speaking and so on so um, but that was often the um, the choice of the um, of 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 the individual uh, care worker to to do that because the the official recommendation recommendation was to to wear a, a mask instead because that was more effective. Uh, so I think over time also when when the vaccination was rolled out, um, there was 
a lot of focus on the long-term care sector. So, so the priorities changed and, and we understood the need for also prioritizing that sector. Um, and, and as you have also listed on the, on the slide that um, there were um, reimbursement if you uh, became sick of COVID-19 and, and had to go on sick leave or isolation. So you could, you, you didn't lose your income. Um, and it was regarded as a work-related or is regarded as a work-related injury, so you can get some compensation uh, also. Um, so, so in that sense, I think workers were protected and then they would, in general, um, also childcare was set up for, for emergency, uh, emergency staff, like uh, that could be bus drivers and so on, but it also included um, uh, long-term care workers. Hmm. Um, yeah, another thing that I was really struck by in, in your interview was around bonus pay. I think there was also bonus pay for staff doing overtime, but that actually one manager reflected on that necessar not necessarily being the best option, giving that entire staff out to work yeah. overtime and to rather prioritize things like development, training, support. I think there was also psychological support that was offered to staff. Yeah, I, I, that, and that struck me as well because she, she really said that the bonus pay was not to her the best incentive for mm. uh, for, for for providing the best care because people might take double shifts and 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 turn up to work and be quite tired. So mm. so instead, mm. yes, you prioritized uh, on the job training, mm. um, and I think also in general, I think that the interviews showed that there was a really consideration taken towards um, this group of 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 staff staff maybe. Um, being quite nervous because they were also the ones uh, once the healthcare sector was was uh, offered the uh, vaccines, they were the ones uh, who had to stand first in line in terms of of uh, being offered the, the the vaccinations. So there were many talks and and um, and. And, and no pressure, it seems, from the managers to 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 take the vaccination. And they said, we, we don't know who has the vaccination, uh, neither mm -hmm. from residents, actually, or staff. And, and they said, we, we are quite sensitive that this is a, this is a sensitive issue. Uh, also pointing out that um, th because we know that uh, certain parts of the population uh, with a non-Danish background and so on have a, a less... Uh, reclined uh, to or, or, uh, to inclined to take the vaccination and and this is something that this sector we have a high proportion of of um, care workers with non-danish background so so they the managers really try to negotiate or 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 accommodate um, that this was the, the situation they had in Denmark. We have uh, doctors in place uh, in in the nursing homes, and and they actually use the doctors to say, "Well, go and talk to the doctor here, and and get some information about what we know about the vaccination." And that was very helpful because then the, the manager didn't didn't need to be sort of in between and and being the one promoting the vac uh, vaccination. Mm. It's really interesting. I um, wonder whether we should maybe move on to the next slide, because uh, I can also see the chat is quite busy, and then we can have a more open discussion at the end and maybe come back to some of those themes. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Adelina. Um, so yeah, the, the last big sort of priority in England is around resources and infrastructure. And one thing I've been really struck by in, in interviews was that interviews highlighted that one of the things that really helped was um, that they received all the money. They, they said they received all the money and the, the resources they needed at the beginning, that that wasn't really sort of an issue. Whereas, and, and, and that's not just sort of, I mean, yeah, even like going into the pandemic that the system has a relatively stable funding source and there's the stability of funding, whereas in England there's, it's very fragmented, it's very sort of fragile, it's often one off and not, not really this clarity and um, yeah I wonder would, would you say this is a fair assessment um, and do you think it helped and in what ways? I I think um, there was there were no changes to to the resources which were allocated to the sector. On, on the contrary, um, because of of the high uh, hygiene standards which were introduced, there were more resources for cleaning. Um, so the managers I spoke to did not mention that uh, resources were were an issue. Uh, of course, in terms of personnel, uh, staff, uh, because when when they became sick and and or needed to go into isolation, that was the resource which was uh, in shortage. Um, but generally, um, it it seemed to flow quite well. Um, and I think also what you have on your slide in terms of the high quality data. Uh, so so. 
we have uh, because we have registers uh, for for quite a lot of, of, of data and and in that sense um not that the local managers had access to to for instance uh, data on whether uh, residents or, or staff were were uh, positive uh, in in terms of, of had, having covid but i think in general getting an understanding of what is the situation uh, in the municipality across nursing homes, for instance, uh, very quickly understanding that this is where uh, the situation is is quite severe in terms of a number of staff being ill and so on, and they could uh, allocate staff from one nursing home to another. So that that was very helpful. Than the, the the managers say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very very impressed by your data and information uh, structures in Denmark. That's something I think we we are quite envious of, um, given that yeah, there's sort of a lack of understanding and many data gaps um, here in England when it comes to the social care sector. Um, and I've also heard, yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard when I spoke to the municipalities that it really sort of this, like it drove this, this um, data-driven decision-making, but there was obviously also a burden involved. They said at some point it got, it got a lot sort of this constant sharing and, and the, the burden um, of, of sharing that data. Um, yeah, and another theme um, that that's really sort of stands out is um, that the the um, community, mainly community-based provision of care, and then the nursing facilities that are, I think most of them, if, if I'm correct, are, are modern. So you've got the apartments where people have their own facilities, and it's almost living like in a flat rather than in a shared space. Um, whereas in England, a lot of the estate is, is very old. Um, there's a lack of investment. And um, generally, the infrastructure, infrastructure is quite fragile. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be very intrigued for you to tell us a bit more about, about what it looks like in Denmark. Well, that, that is the correct uh, uh, presentation, I think, because uh, we, we do have, we have since 87, 1987, we have to, uh, not built any traditional nursing homes like where you would share rooms or anything. So every resident has their own facilities. And that also has made it much more uh, easy to to isolate residents if, if they uh, had COVID uh, in, in their own uh, apartment. Um, so it, it was extremely helpful. And, and also, um, it was interesting. Uh, we also I also interviewed some um, uh, somebody from from the health authorities and and uh, and and what she said was that the the infrastructure in terms of of, of nursing homes um, in and in terms of virus and and like the like COVID nineteen was very much at the attention now. Sort of, um, it's it might be helpful like we have in in Denmark that you have your own sort of apartment with uh, your own, uh, of course, door into the apartment, but but many of them also had, uh, because it's it's low housing, so they would have access to a little garden or whatever. And that actually meant that you have two ent entries into the apartment and and, the, and therefore didn't need to, to walk a, a long a common corridors or anything like that, which eventually could uh, be a risk in, in, in spreading the disease. So so thinking about um, the infrastructure in terms of, of building uh, nursing homes uh, is is certainly also uh, on, on the agenda. And, and this is something they, they're going to produce a report about uh, quite soon. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll move on to the final sort of discussion point. I've got, um, well, two final questions for you, Tina. One is, um, what would you say is sort of the main takeaway in terms of learning for other countries slash England? Uh, I, I mean, I can't say that we should be prepared because how can you prepare for a situation that you had no idea would, would uh, take place? But, but I think um, what was interesting was that we also learned that, yes, we, we have to try to ensure that people do not get infected, but there is also something like quality of life. And if you isolate people and they die alone and nobody with them if they can't see their their relatives then it's not uh, it's not a good life um and and i think that we at some point uh, we we needed to take that uh discussion because we were quite strict in in lockdowns and and trying to protect um this part of the population um but there are there are limits, I would say, to, to that uh, strategy. But then otherwise, I think um, because we have a, such an integrated uh, health and social care system, mm. uh, that, that that is really 
uh, that can be recommended. Um, and of course, also to have a high proportion of staff with, with uh, basic education. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. that's, of course, not in it's it's not so achievable and in in a situation of all countries are struggling to find uh, care workers mm. so mm. yeah yeah big challenge everywhere yeah um where is denmark heading what next for denmark what are your current sort of priorities reform priorities um not necessarily to do with with covid but we are trying to because we've we have um we have different legislation uh, dealing with social care on the one hand and then health on the other hand and we are going to have a reform of of that trying to integrate the two um and that is quite interesting and i think also it 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 might be um a bit of a shift in terms of our quite generous approach to providing uh, long term care with with more um what should you say um uh the, the expectation that informal care will be will be more dominant and and the the state cannot provide uh, to the degree that it has uh, done so previously but as i said it doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, with covid but just in terms of aging of populations and and the general resource situation mm. well we'll we'll look closely watch <laughs> where you're <laughs> heading um you yeah, know that's been really really fascinating thank you um and i've seen that there are many questions in the chat um yeah sure, there, I think Natasha and there are that, yeah. yeah there are yeah. Laura thank you so much to both of you for that fascinating um walk around Denmark we've got several questions here on the workforce I think um Emily's posed a few Emily I don't know if you just want to come in and and pose your questions verbally so that everyone can hear sure um Thanks very much. So yeah, so I guess I'm just interested in trying to understand a bit more about what was already in existence in Denmark, particularly, I guess, firstly around the what the baseline skills and training looks like for frontline care staff. And then secondly, around you, you said something along the lines that there were, there were doctors embedded in nursing homes. So I was just interested in what that looks like and how that compares to the GP's support to care homes in, in England. Yeah. So to start with, with the doctors in place, uh, this was a reform which took place, I think, three, four years ago based on an evaluation showing that um, generally the GP or the doctor uh, uh, care seemed to improve when you had a, a, a doctor in place because then the person either had a, a, um, some training in, in geriatrics or or because um, the person was was uh, having patients uh, um, with, with geriatric uh, uh, symptoms, um, they, they quickly um, gained very good skills. Um, and so, 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 so the, the very evaluation was that this was something we should introduce in, in nursing homes in general. Um, so it means that when you move into a nursing home that you, you, you change your, your, from your GP to, to the nursing home uh, a doctor. Um, and in terms of, of, um, of, of the education uh, of, of, of care staff, we have two, two different um, uh, educations. We have one which is called the social care and health helper, which is a duration of two years and, and two months. And it's mainly focused on tasks uh, related to support with personal care and hygiene, as well as uh, household uh, chores, and also has a 20 week introductory uh, basic course. And then they have a mix of practical training periods and school study after that. And the social and healthcare assistant education is is a separate education, um, and it has uh, you you receive an authorization when you finish your study, and it takes three years and ten months, and is focused on uh, provision of personal care, health promotion, uh, prevention, and and also nursing functions. So it's it's particular the health promotion, prevention, and nursing functions which separates this from uh, from the from the helper uh, education, uh, and this is also a mix of of practical training periods and, and school study. Can, can I just ask Tina, so is that compulsory for everybody working in the sector? Can people work without those basic trainings or how does that work? Yeah, they can because the problem, is, preferably uh, all staff would have uh, either of these two educations, uh, but because it's difficult to, um, to, to, to uh, recruit staff. Uh, so at the moment now we have around 25% who do not have an education or at least have uh, finished their education. Uh, we, uh, there's a high dropout rate from these schools and, and uh, it's my sort of uh, um, feeling that a, a number of these, they, they stop uh, in the education and take up work instead because they can earn much more money. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, Emily, do you want to ask about the data sharing structures as well? And then one more question. 
I think that was someone else. Oh, sorry, that was Emma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coming, yeah, sorry, that was me. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I work um, on a team that focuses on the digitization of social care. So I guess I was really interested when you were saying that the kind of data sharing and access to data that you have have worked really well. So I just wondered if you could expand a little bit more on how that works and, and sort of, I suppose, how people working in the sector have responded to types of changes around digital as well and the use of data. Yeah, I have to say it's not my research area. So, um, um, but but generally we have, um, and and this is something which has been criticised immensely in the sector. We we have since the the eighties nineties introduced a lot of documentation. So, um, people uh, frontline staff feel that they use a lot of time in filling in uh, different schemes and so on. But it also means that we can follow um, uh, home care users and residents in nursing homes quite well, uh, and you can. Uh, if if you have the, the the license or the access to it, you can you can uh, access uh, healthcare data. Um, see, for instance, uh, the GP or or or, or, or the, the doctor in the nursing homes um, different uh, notes and, and and so on. But but of course, it, it you need to have the the the, the right uh, authorization to to access this data. Um, but there is a the 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 um, attempt to to um, uh, also to to um, make sure that you can access both health and, and social care data uh, but because it's it's still two systems uh, it's sometimes not that uh, easy to do that and this is also why we're changing the the law i don't know if that answered your question i'm yeah, not an expert in data so <laughs> yeah i know it's quite a technical one but no that's helpful and i think yeah we're facing the same issues here in terms of the two separate systems and trying to share that information across health Okay. and social care so yeah it's a shared challenge mm -hmm. thank, thank you thanks emma and um, we have a hand up from g wilson sorry i don't know your, your first name oh right <laughs> yeah that's me gavin um go ahead yeah hi sorry it's not relating to the um coronavirus but i just wanted you said about the nursing home structure is that uh every resident has a separate apartment i just wondered how does that work in terms of you know people with dementia who need kind of almost constant supervision um, well, they are some nursing homes have separate uh, dementia sections. Um, I honestly don't know. To, mm. It's I, I don't do research in dementia, but but mm. it's not my understanding that 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 is an issue in terms of having your own separate uh, uh, apartment. I mean, it, yeah. it 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 is it is. You should consider it like it. it's an it's an institution. It's it's a nursing home institution. It's mm. just that you have your own facilities in terms of, of of a bedroom, a small kitchenette, and and your your own bathroom and toilet. So if the door to the apartment needs to to be open all the time, that's how it is. Mm. Mm. So it's it's just I think better space uh, and and better facilities. Also, if you want to have some some private life, uh, but staff is around all the time. It's not that they right. they're not there. So it's twenty four seven, of course. Um, yeah, because the way you described it was like almost like they were little little bungalows with um, their own garden and things like that. that yeah. Okay. No. No. It's it's it it would be like. Um... In the center, you would have uh, common facilities or, ah. or a community, yeah, a room, and and yeah. then if if you live in a in in a place where there's a little, where you have access to a garden, that would be mm. from the other side of of, of the apartment, in so yeah, to yeah. say, yeah. I'm so it's not like it. a bungalow style where you're not uh, attached to to uh, um, communal facilities. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Tina, just as a, a sort of follow up on that care home infrastructure question i'm quite interested in where the investments come from you said since 1987 you've not built any traditional nursing homes where has the money come from has that been funded by through public pocket or have you relied on private investment can you just talk a little bit about that well it, it, in general and for the most parts it's it's been uh, public uh, uh, money uh, it it um, it in this in the sense that when the municipalities are building these homes but quite a lot of, of homes are private but uh, non-profit and then it's been uh, different um, 
not Red Cross, but organizations like like that, which have, have built their own um, uh, nursing homes, and and then they're under contract with the municipality. Uh, the pro for profit sector has been very little, and it, especially in, in comparison to Sweden, for instance, where where this is quite large, this sector, but it's it's uh, increasing. Uh, so now we we increasingly also see that the pension funds are investing in in uh, in nursing homes, mm -hmm. um, and 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 they often. Um, they're under uh, contract with the municipality, but they can decide uh, who who do they want to take in as residents, um, and and therefore might not take uh, residents with with severe uh, issues. Mm. Okay, thank you. That that's really interesting. Um, your mention of Sweden there was quite timely because I think David, do you want to come in with your question? Yeah, it's um, thanks for the presentation and comment and discussion. I was just curious. Do you have a view on? What happened in Sweden, essentially, in the long term care sector? I mean, uh, I'm assuming that they were, although they probably were, well, how strict were they, given they were quite un uh, not strict with the, with the general population? Did they protect old people, uh, residents of uh, nursing care services well enough? Um, and what about the staff working those services? Do you know at all? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, that's a very dangerous question. And I can't, <laughs> in a sense, uh, because it's very difficult to say. I, I would, I, in, in the early days, it, it seemed like uh, uh, the strategy that that Sweden applied uh, was more dangerous in the sense uh, of, of increase in, in mortality. Um, but we also have to say, what once uh, lockdowns were introduced, also in Sweden, that it, it seemed to even out. And there are also some differences in in the demographics of of the two populations, with Sweden having a much uh, older population. Um, and, and more frail it seemed so um so it's very difficult to say what was indeed um the outcome of of, of quite different approaches in the two countries but the swedish uh, covid commission has been quite critical towards the the, the national response uh, there and has initiated um and the need for investigating how to reform the the long-term care uh, sector um so so comparing the two countries um it it was quite interesting to see the very relaxed and that's how we saw it from 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 uh, from Denmark uh, in the beginning but they did introduce uh, later on uh, lockdowns and so on which uh, did seem to protect um, the population but they had a higher uh, community uh, infection rate and and as, as as said earlier this seemed to have been uh, the most uh, important factor in in terms of of also uh, how all the people were were, were hit Thanks, Tina, for that. Um, Caroline, can you can you have your hand up? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I just wondered if you say a little bit more about, for example, if you're an older person with significant health problems living at home, what do you get? So what does the integration really look like in practice for people living in their own homes, please? Yeah, you would, uh, first of all, if you if you needed help, you would approach the municipality and they would, first of all, um, consider whether you had what they call is the potential for reablement. And that means not only, you can say the physical potential, but certainly also the mental and also the willingness to to go in and, and change your daily routines and so on. So reablement would be introduced uh, to you uh, as a short intervention and trying to see if you could, could cope in different ways uh, doing your household uh, chores. Uh, um, it could be uh, at the same time you could receive some some home care. It could be cleaning, or uh, and it could also be personal care if you if you need that. And in principle, you should be able to receive um, as much uh, uh, care that you need in, in in terms of personal care. But most municipalities would say, well, if you need uh, very intensive care, it 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 would be recommendable that you move into a nursing home. So I would say the personal care situation is relatively okay uh, compared to other countries as well. It's whether it's in terms of the cleaning services, which have really declined uh, and where today some municipalities might provide cleaning uh, every three weeks or every four or five weeks, even uh, maybe saying we don't hoover, we just wash the floors and so on. Uh, so it's, it's become more symbolic and, and that's where I think the real changes are going to take place in the yeah. future. And we're probably going to skip the cleaning part because uh, and yeah. yeah, you need what we would call here district nurse support, low level medical support. Is it joined up? Is are it there is. teams? Yeah, it it is it is integrated in in the community care services. So so uh, the 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 home nurse uh, works uh, in the municipality and and coordinates uh, the the services with uh, the home care team. Thank you. 
welcome. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think we're uh, just about out of time, so we'll stop questions there. Adelina. Yeah, so th from me, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, this was a very, very thoughtful and, and very useful discussion. And I think there's uh, plenty of takeaways here. And I think it's it's quite often the case that when we talk about, oh, we should look at what Denmark's doing, quite often people will just say, oh, well, they spend a lot, so it would be better. <laughs> but understanding these nuances of the mechanisms through which things worked well is extremely helpful. So thank you very much from me. And uh, I'm going to mention that next week on Tuesday, we're going to be hearing about the experience of Japan, a very different type of system uh, with a very different experience of the pandemic. And again, with plenty of learning opportunities. Um, we mentioned as well that later in April, in March, about around the 14th of March, we are going to release the England report and we will be bringing together these case studies and producing a report also towards the end of March. So thank you very much, Tina and Laura and all the participants and all these excellent yeah. questions and maybe see some of you next week. Thank you. Thank you very much.